Um, don't worry, mine's quick. <laughs> Uh, my name is Lauren Invernoni, and I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm here doing a four week research rotation with Dr. Moshe Farr, and today I'm going to present one of his patients um, titled A Case Report of Recurrent Epithelial Irregularity. Um, so the patient is a 69 year old male who presented first to his general ophthalmologist with complaint of blurry vision um, in the left eye associated with a foreign body sensation that had been going on for the last two years. Um, his past medical history was basically non-contributory um, except for a corneal abrasion in the left eye five months prior to this initial presentation. Um, on exam, he was found to have mild blepharitis um, in both eyes, mild anterior subcapsular cataract in both eyes, and in the left cornea, he was found to have superficial punctate keratopathy um, that became confluent at the superior limbus, um, as well as a dendritic pattern of irregular epithelium that stained with fluorescein. So this patient was initially treated for chronic herpes dendritic keratitis, um, he was treated with Zergan, Valcyclovir, and artificial tears, and then two weeks later was started on Omnipred drops. Um, over this course of treatment, his vision fluctuated between uh, 2060 and 2100, and the epithelial lesions d uh, never fully resolved. Um, after 19 weeks, a superficial keratectomy and culture were performed. Um, the stain was negative for amoeba, and the PCR was negative for herpes simplex and varicella. At this point, the patient was started on doxycycline and referred here to the Moran for further workup and treatment. So on presentation here, the best corrected visual acuity in the left eye was 2100, and the slit lamp examination showed raised areas of thickened punctate epithelium, which originated here um, at the superior limbus and then extended inferiorly um, in an hourglass distribution. And then here you can see a closer image of these epithelial infiltrates. Um, this shows the fluorescein stain. Uh, you can see a little uptake of dye um, up here, uh, but no clear epithelial defects. Um, also, if you look up here at the superior limbus, um, you can see tortuous blood vessels. And then this photo um, shows the ocular panis along the superior limbus. Um, here we have a pentacam image. Uh, this shows hyperreflectivity um, in the central corneal epithelium. So you can see that on the left eye, um, whereas in the right it's normal. And then uh, we have the topography of the cornea. Um, you can see in the left eye, there's some irregularities um, in the area of the epithelial infiltrates. So to summarize, uh, we have a 69-year-old male who presents with a several month history of unilateral punctate epithelial infiltrates, um, a dendritic pattern of irregular epithelium and ocular panis along the superior limbus, who has been unresponsive to antiviral, antibiotic, and anti-inflammatory treatment. So does anyone have um, any ideas for the differential they'd like to share? It's okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a broad differential for this patient. Um, he was initially treated for herpes simplex dendritic keratitis um, based on the dendritic pattern seen when he initially presented. Um, however, he did not respond to this treatment and also the PCR was negative. Um, floppy eyelid syndrome can also cause uh, a superficial punctate keratopathy. Um, basically, if the eyelid is accidentally averted during sleep, this leads to corneal exposure. Um, SLK, or superior limbal keratoconjunctivitis, um, could also explain um, some of these findings, specifically the thickening inflammation and injection at the superior limbus. Um, however, this is often bilateral, um, and in our patient it was unilateral. Uh, recurrent corneal erosion was also considered, um, as this can also cause a punctate keratopathy. However, this is usually very painful. 
Um, a localized limbal stem cell deficiency uh, was considered as well as rosacea, blepharokeratitis. And last, um, we have ocular surface squamous neoplasia. Um, so this includes both conjunctival and corneal intraepithelial neoplasia, or CIN. Um, it most commonly originates at the limbus. So for this patient, um, based on his clinical course uh, and the exam findings, uh, CIN was thought to be most likely. So a preliminary diagnosis of CIN was made, and the patient was started on interferon drops. Um, after three and a half months, the visual acuity in the left eye had improved to 2015, um, and the cornea showed no more evidence of CIN. Um, you can see here, this image was taken one month after interferon was started, um, and there's no evidence of the epithelial infiltrates. And you can also see that the ocular panis um, is resolving. Uh, so then I've included a brief discussion on CIN. Um, it's relatively rare, seen most often in older males with lightly pigmented skin and hair. Other risk factors include UVB radiation, HPV, heavy smoking, and petroleum exposure. Um, it can present as blurry vision and foreign body sensation, as it did in this patient, um, but it can also be completely asymptomatic. Um, on exam, it's characteristically located at the limbus, uh, like we saw here. Um, it can appear gelatinous, but can also be leukoplakic or papilliform, and it's often associated uh, with tufts of blood vessels. Traditional treatment for CIN is surgical excision um, with chirotherapy. However, um, more recent treatments include topical chemotherapy, such as interferon, mitomycin C, 5-fluorouracil, and retinoic acid. Um, the topical chemotherapies are good for lesions that are flat um, or small and would be difficult to surgically resect, and there's actually um, a lower recurrence rate when treated with the topical chemotherapy compared to excision. Um, the prognosis with treatment of CIN is good. The lesions are slow-growing and have a low malignant potential. Um, so in conclusion, this case is an unusual presentation of a relatively rare disorder. Um, CIN is, can be difficult to diagnose because it's easily mistaken for a variety of other disorders. Um, so it's important in patients like this who are refractory to treatment and have had um, this going on for years, uh, it's important to have a high clinical suspicion. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Moshefar and Dr. Muthapam. Questions? So sometimes the general pathologist 